Good morning, Aunt Bethel. Good morning, Fred. Well, it's a beautiful Sunday morning. Yes, it is. Couldn't you ask for nicer weather? Merry Christmas to those of you that haven't had a Merry Christmas yet. I think everyone has, but uh, you never know. Anyway, we welcome you to our Sunday morning worship service. We're glad you're here. And we'll turn it right over to our worship team. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. <laughs> Please stand with me if you're really in Lord, this day after Christmas, God, that we just um, recognize this, the, the birth of Jesus, our incredible Savior. We're so thankful, Lord, for him and um, all the blessings uh, that we have in our lives, God, and just know that you're in control and we're thankful for that. Um, I just pray this morning that we would give all the things we came in with over to you, Lord, and just worship you. And celebrate your son every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills, everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus. Oh, the humble 
church. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I didn't think it was possible to shorten my uh, commute from work, but I'm doing a pretty good job here. Here to here, working out. For the B team here. Glad to see you here this post Christmas morning. It's sort of a it's sort of an opportunity for us to catch our breath and say, okay, we, we've made it to Christmas. Now what? Now what? This morning, I want to preach to you a message I've been wrestling with for more than a year and a half. The message is, nothing changes if nothing changes. I told a couple of dear friends as I was working my way through this message that God had given me. And I said, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat tempted to make it one of those epic drop the mic moments <laughs> where I just approach the platform and say, nothing changes if nothing changes. <laughs> Boom. Boom. And that in itself would be the message. But I wrestled with it some more. And so God has given me just a little more. Because I have a great heart's desire to bring Him glory and honor and praise in all that I do. And I have a heart for you to give you what you need. Not necessarily what you want. So with that motivation, I begin. When I was a young boy, we moved to a nice neighborhood on the other side of Orlando, Florida, to a community called Winter Park. Where my folks bought a home. It was a really nice home. It sat on the end of a cul-de-sac. Looked a little too... Americana for me. And I thought, well, they must know what they're doing. It wasn't long after they bought it that things began to change. My mom painted every room a different color. You walked into the front door, the foyer, and it was very oriental in design, a very burnt orange with gold motif that she hand drew and hand painted. And she had a, a table that she had custom made for it. And, and it had a little a Buddha head sat there and a little, a uh, couple of, a little, uh, looked like a little part of a castle there. And, and it was this kind of uh, ornamental kind of looking. Then you went to the immediate left and it was stark white. Everything was stark white. You went around there and into the dining area and it was a beautiful teak and brown kind of look, warm color. Her master bedroom, their master bedroom was blue, huge blue rug that sat on the wall that kind of had this kind of waving pattern through it, almost looked like sea water breaking over. You go this way out of the foyer into a kitchen area and it was parrot green. You go into the, the den area and it was the same color. You made your way down the hallway uh, at the end of the back of the, the living room, and there was an empty bedroom, and then there was down the hallway, my sister's room was a bright yellow and white. And my room, it was kind of blue, but it had racing stripes that went up one wall and then continued down the other wall. My mom did all of this with my dad, and everything was absolutely beautiful. It had all new furniture in it, and the lawn was meticulous. And then they decided to put a pool in, and it was absolutely wonderful. I was really, really excited when we found out that the guys who were digging the pool dug the pool uh, about two feet too deep. So now it was deeper than the average pool. I was so excited. Everything was just perfect. Until it wasn't. You see, with all that stuff, Dad was working more. With all that stuff, my mom began to work. 
he would take her and he would drop her off and then he would go do his second job or, or whatever. And so they were always working. And it wasn't long before all the stresses and the strains began to take its toll. And the next thing I knew, my parents were arguing all the time. Sister and I, we tried to stay low key. So we played outside a lot. We played kickball and freeze tag and kick the can. We played cowboys and Indians. And we, we, pro, uh, we, we rode our bikes and skateboards in the cul de sac. And we did all kinds of, of fun stuff right there with our little group of friends because we didn't want to too far into the neighborhood because there were bullies out there. And, and I was little for my age, and they thought it was a lot more fun to pick on a little guy than to do anything else. So my little group of friends right there, we kind of stayed right in the cul-de-sac until we kind of outgrew it. So then we came up with this really great plan. It was born out of a Hogan's Heroes episode. We decided to dig a tunnel underneath the doghouse in the backyard. It went down and then went right underneath the back fence into the ditch, the canal behind the subdivision, but it ran behind the house. So that way we could lift up the, the doghouse, jump down in, and make our way out. And our parents would think, oh, they're just playing out in the yard or in the cul-de-sac someplace. The whole time we had made our way down the canal into the wooded area where we'd play all kinds of things. In Florida, where this was, was at, they had these little wild potatoes that grew. And so we would pretend, and we would throw them at each other and carry on, and we'd play in the woods and have all kinds of fun. It was like being on a, a secret mission. It was so exciting for us. We played for hours there. We looked for snakes and turtles. We were convinced there was an alligator in a little pond nearby the wooded area there. And we would make our way to try to figure them out. Somebody came up with a brilliant plan. Now I know this is hard for you to conceive of, so I'll, I'll try to demonstrate it for you. There was, at that time, there was a little, uh, like a sandbox that was shaped like a little boat, and it was about this tall, and it was just a little bitty thing. Anybody ever saw one of those? No. Okay, well somebody has. So, so here's the deal. So you would get that little boat, and we decided instead of it being a sandbox, we would make it the boat in the pond. Mm. So what we would do is only one person could get in there, and it would be like, can you go all the way across the pond before the gator gets you? <laughs> so you'd be in there and you'd have your little stick and you'd be like, ooh. And you look at the guys and they'd be like, yeah, we're there. <laughs> yeah. And you'd be traveling a little bit further on and then, then you, you, just, you just knew you were way out there far from land. And then they'd say, I think he's coming. <laughs> and you'd be looking around, you'd be scouring everything, moving around. And you try to make your way back. But then you're like, oh, don't turn around, don't turn around, go for it. We make our way all the way back across to the weeds. You know those, they look like corn dogs on sticks. <laughs> Cattails. Cattails, that's what they're doing. And we make our way back. We had all kinds of fun. And we played and played and played. We played all kinds of stuff. Until one day. Until one day, everything changed. The argument that had seemed to grow and grow became so incredible. It took over the house. And then there was this incident. They separated, my father moved out. And everything went from bad to worse with the divorce that followed it. It wasn't fun to be at that house anymore. I remember the first Christmas after the divorce, it was very dark and depressing. The Christmas decor in the tree wasn't like it had always been. I remember how my mom tried to give my sister and I each a gift. It wasn't much of anything because we couldn't afford anything. She cried all Christmas Day. The 
It seems like we all three found ourselves floundering. We didn't know what to say or what to do on that Christmas. We were all lost, looking for something to hold on to, looking for something to turn it around. My mother worked and began to date. It seemed like she worked all day and, and into the night, and then after work she would go out with her friends and, and try to have some kind of sense of life and well-being. As kids, we didn't know what to do. We were basically taking care of ourselves. Seemed like my mom was doing the best she could just to take, take care of the bills. And our dad had decided that his new life didn't include us. Soon, everybody was living their own separate lives. I didn't have a family anymore. We were just living there. Everybody on their own. Life became very dark and very difficult and very depressing and very discouraging for me as a young boy. There were a lot of things that contributed to that, but it broke me. It broke my heart. It broke my mind. It broke my spirit. Everything about me was broken. I had given up on being a kid. I didn't play anymore. I didn't laugh anymore. I didn't hope or dream. I didn't love him. I gave up on life. I was 12 years old. And I remember thinking, I just wish I had a do-over. I remember feeling like the time of playing games and having fun with my family's my, my friends was over. So one day I, I packed up every toy in my, my room and and I, and I packed it all up in these boxes and I took it over to the neighbor's house where some of the, the younger uh, friends in my neighborhood lived and I, I handed over those toys to, to their mother and I told them, I want you to give these toys to your boys. I don't have time to play anymore. I turned and walked away, leaving all my toys with them. I could hear the boys shouting in excitement to see what the boxes contained. Part of me was happy for them. Part of me was still just hurting. I was a 12-year-old kid, and I was already wishing that life would either give me a do-over, or it would just be over. This part of my life, I don't talk about a lot. This part of my life wasn't easy, it wasn't fun, and fortunately for me, it was not the end of my story. It was just a bad chapter, but it was an important chapter because in that chapter, God taught me an awful lot. Those painful things that I experienced have now been used to help me reach out to others. You see, you can't really fully appreciate what mercy, grace, and love feel like, what they mean, until you're the recipient of them. Amen. You can't really appreciate what it means to have a duo. Life never gave me one. It just gave me a do. <laughs> but the Lord gave me a duo. The Lord changed me completely. And he's, he's willing to do the same for anyone who would turn to him and simply ask the Lord to say, I need a do-over. Everything can start again as new, but there's a catch. And that's what I need to tell you about today. Stand with me in honor of reading God's Word this morning. That wasn't me. <laughs> 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The text reads, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. Let's pray. Lord, how I pray that this message, Lord, with its timely, its timely utterance, would give us, Lord, as we stand on the threshold of a new year, a new chance, 
a do-over. Lord, not everyone in this room knows you like I do. There are many who do. Many who have experienced exactly what I'm talking about today. There are some, Lord, in their heart of hearts, they're thinking, oh, I wish it could be so. Because life isn't giving me a do-over, it's just giving me a do list. I need a do-over. So God, I pray that you would open our, our ears and our eyes, our hearts and our minds, that we would be receptive to what you would have for us today. That we would begin this new year with a new start, with a new view, and a new me, with a new mind. So I told you that the Lord pressed upon me this message. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Somewhere along the way, I read the Zig Ziglar quote, Choices, chances, changes. You must make a choice to take a chance or your life will never change. I thought about it for a while. I thought I could just preach a New Year's sermon about making a new choice. Well, that would be typical. I could just preach a New Year's sermon about taking a new chance. That would be presumable. I could just preach a New Year's sermon about change. That would be too predictable. But what if I preached a New Year's sermon that included all three? Choice, chance, and change. And I did it in the most clear and concise manner possible. And in the shortest manner message I could ever preach. Well, here it is. Straight out of scripture. Nothing changes if nothing changes. I could end the message, like I said, right here and right now. And it would be sufficient for some, but not for all. For their sakes, I want to expound a little further on this topic. You would think that Paul could not possibly make the statement any more clear or concise than the way he wrote it just now. Yet for all of its brevity and clarity people somehow continue to muddle its meaning. This must have been clear to Paul as well, for we next see his thoughts again on the subject in Ephesians 4, where he goes into even greater detail writing. Ephesians 4, 22 through 32, if you want to bookmark that and go to it later. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no more, must work doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mind, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their need, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Paul did as much as he could to minimize any possibility of misunderstanding, of misinterpretation, or mistake being made with his intended point. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Amen? Amen! Amen. Some of you are looking like, whoa. Sorry. Curl up your toes because it gets worse, okay? I don't want to see it gets better, okay? First, put off the old self and put on the new self. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your mind 
and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Secondly, put off old habits. Take on new habits. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. And for we are all members of one body. He goes on to say, and in your anger do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry. Do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who's been stealing must steal no longer but must work, doing something useful with their own hands, that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Nothing changes if nothing changes. You're either going to be living for yourself, the old person, satisfying the self, the old way, or you're going to be living with a new mind, with a new heart, with a new attitude in life, and doing for others as God has done for you. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Amen? Amen. Rejection on. <laughs> Thirdly, get rid of every form. Just as Christ. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ forgave you. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Get rid of everything else that's the exact opposite of kindness and compassion and put on kindness and compassion because that's what he did for you and for me. Amen? Amen. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Present tense. Not it might show up. Someday. I'm working on it. I'm trying. It is. We take God's word for what it purports to be, God's revelation of himself to mankind, and that God's word is God's command and God's instruction for how mankind should live. And then that God's word reveals the only way we can experience new life is for us to be redeemed, reconciled, and restored to right relationship with God through the drawing of the Holy Spirit, which is made possible by the substitutionary, sacrificial, atoning work of God's Son on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. Salvation is by grace through faith alone in Christ. Our part is simply believing in faith that Christ died for our sin, that God has raised him from the dead. And if we believe this in our hearts and confess this with this, our mouths, we will be saved. For everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. This is what we find in Ephesians 2, 8, 9 and Romans 10, 9 to 13. There is something there, but there's something more. A catch. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Paul again addresses the issue in Galatians 5, 16 and 25. He says, nothing changes if nothing changes at all. So I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Listen. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But I love this part. But, say it with me, 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Amen? Amen. Amen. Guys, life never gave me a do-over. It just gave me a do. God, God did. He gave me a do-over. It was very difficult, very dark, very depressing, and very discouraged young boy with a broken heart, mind, and spirit. Given up on trusting people and having hopes and dreams and wanting to live. I'd given up on everything and everyone. I was filled with anger, bitterness, and resentment. I was lost. But God hadn't given up on me. At the age of 16, the Lord saved me. At 17, He called me into ministry. The Lord changed me. He changed my whole life. I'm no longer the young man who was so difficult, dark, depressed, and discouraged. I'm no longer the man with a broken heart and mind and soul and spirit. I trust again. I have hopes and dreams again. I love again. And I love life again. Mm -hmm. I want to do more. I want to be more. I want to give more. I want to see more happen for others. I want to be all that God has created me and called me to be. I frame my life around some simple principles. I want to be all the man that God created me to be. I want to be the husband my wife deserves. I want to be the dad my kids need me to be. Everything else comes after those things. If it doesn't fit within that paradigm, it's not part of my life. No matter how much I like it or how much the world promotes it, it can't be part of my life. Because you see, the old is gone. The new is coming. I've been transformed. And am being transformed in the renewing of my mind in Christ Jesus. Does that mean I'm perfect? No. There are still times when anger makes its ugly head. If you're driving slowly in front of me in traffic. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I've had many missteps, many wrong turns, many stumbles along the way. I've experienced many failings, fallen many times. I found myself struggling with some things along the journey. I've been through an awful lot of my life. Many trials, many troubles, many times of temptation and testing. And I have failed the Lord many times, more than I Sometimes that old man in me. Sometimes that hurt young boy in me. Sometimes the new man that I am, I have to sit down and talk with him again. And tell him it's okay. You can't control what happened to us. You can't decide how we're going to deal with moving forward. A lot of what I went through has helped me be a better man of God. A lot of what I went through helped me be a better husband. A lot of what I went through made me determined to be the dad I wish I'd had.
truly say that turning to Christ was the one best decision I ever made in my life. Amen. It changed everything. Mm -hmm. The second best decision I ever made was marrying my beautiful wife. Amen. 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 That too was one of the best things that ever happened. I'm not perfect, far from it. In fact, some days I'm quite disappointed with myself. I'm my own worst critic. I'm not content to accept, as Martin Luther King Jr. once said, I may not be the man I want to be. I may not be the man I ought to be. I may not be the man I could be. I may not be the man I truly can be. But praise God, I'm not the man I once was. Amen. 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 I'm not those things. I'm not the man I once was. I'm not the man I want to be, ought to be, could be, or truly can be. But I will be. Listen. Bless the Lord. With his strength, I will be. I will be the better man I was meant to be. Forged in the fire. down, bruised, battered, but God has lifted me from that. He's created in me a heart's desire to love him with every fiber of my being, to love others, to see them through life's difficult times. the simple truth of all of this is nothing changes if nothing changes. We all need a little help to make that happen. If you want to see change, you've got to be willing to make a choice. Be willing to take a chance. And then be willing to do whatever is necessary to experience that change. Sometimes we need someone to come alongside us and say, the change taking place. I know that God's got something for me. I'm here to help. I'm here to encourage. If nothing in our lives has changed since we've turned to God in Christ Jesus, and in truth we sought only to obtain absolution, to appease our guilty consciences, or to escape the consequences for our sin and fear of what God's word declares is punishment, or we Pain or genuine repentance from our sin and turning back to God, all the while knowing that nothing has really changed. When all we wanted was a Christianized version of our old lives, then my friends, I can tell you with all sincerity and clarity of thought, you cannot expect your status to change from sinner to saint, from lost to found, from under wrath penalty of death to new life in Christ because if nothing changes nothing changes God's word has made it abundantly clear I stand as witness to it tell you nothing changes new year. You have an opportunity between now and then to not make a New Year's resolution for that do it. But simply make a commitment. To ask God to show you where you really stand. The scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit will do that. He will speak into our hearts and either tell us one of two things. Either we're a child of God or we're not. But you already know the answer to that. Right. Don't you? You already know if nothing changed. Nothing changes. This morning is a 
worship team plays this last song. How I pray that you would enter 2022 with an attitude that says, I've got a choice. Well, we think this year she's on the next one. 